Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our Restart Kentucky webinar series. We're, we're going to give it just a minute to allow everyone to join now that we have gone live. Thank you to everyone for joining us this afternoon. We're just giving it a minute before we get started as everyone joins the group. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started this afternoon. I'm Kate Shanks, I'm Vice President of Public Affairs for the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce. Again, thank you for joining us for this important discussion that we're having today about criminal justice issues, um, our recovery programs, and how the pandemic, how COVID-19 has impacted our processes. Um, we started this webinar series back in April, really, because we recognized that the Kentucky Chamber really needed to educate and advocate for our members. And so we wanted to pull together experts from a variety of backgrounds to talk about how the pandemic has impacted really the business community in Kentucky as a whole. We are fortunate to have our sponsor with the Kentucky Community and Technical College System. So thank you so much for joining with us as a partner in this effort. Um, and we do record these webinars as we uh, air them and we post them on our Restart Kentucky page. If you haven't already found that resource, you can visit kychamber.com and in our banner at the top of the page, click on the Restart Kentucky page and you will see resources including these webinars. You will also see the reopening schedule issued by the governor as well as healthy at work plans and requirements that businesses need to follow as they reopen. And we're excited that by June 29th, the governor announced uh, last night that all businesses in Kentucky will be open in some capacity. So that's great news for Kentucky as we move forward. I mentioned I will be recording this webinar. If you have to step away or you wanna revisit, please visit our restart page uh, later today, early tomorrow when we have it posted. And if you haven't already found the chat button at the bottom of your screen, that's a great way for you to communicate with us throughout the webinar if there's any questions that you would like to ask or if you'd like for our panelists to clarify. Um, this is a really important topic to the Kentucky Chamber. This is an issue we've been working on for several years now. We know that the pandemic is impacting our corrections, our justice court system. Um, and we wanted to talk about it, not just as a what's happening right now, but what have we learned um, going forward and how could that shape policy for the Commonwealth of Kentucky? Uh, I think this is a situation where we were sort of pushed out of our comfort zone. And when that happens, sometimes there is an opportunity to really learn from our experiences and moving forward. Um, today, I am joined by some true experts in their field. I'm really excited about this panel. We have some pretty smart and experienced individuals that are joining us for this conversation. Uh, we have Secretary Mary Noble, who is the, with the Kentucky Justice and Public Safety Cabinet. She's been with the cabinet for just a few months now, but you know she's no stranger to these justice issues, having served on the Kentucky Supreme Court for 10 years now. She was just remarking on Chief Justice Mitten's background, and it, it's familiar to her. We also have Chief, Chief Justice John Minton Jr. Uh, joining us who um, handles all things related to our court system. Uh, he was elected back in 2006 and then reelected and he has been serving as the Chief Justice since 08. We also have Jennifer Hancock who is President and CEO of Volunteers of America, a great partner of ours here at the Kentucky Chamber. She's been with the organization since 07 and has been president CEO since 2015 and we work with Jennifer on a variety of issues and then also my good friend Aubrey Travis is joining us today. She is the Kentucky State Director for Right on Crime which is a Texas-based group a Texas-based center that's focused on conservative criminal justice reform issues. So welcome to our panelists. Thank you again for joining us and let's go ahead and get started. I want to start with Secretary Noble this afternoon and I think you know, it's best if you could just first tell us a little bit about the pandemic in the correction system. Uh, what does it look like right now? And what do you expect in the next few weeks? Well, Kate, thank you for the opportunity to tell you and your listeners today about what we've been doing at the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet. You know, when I first started out, I never expected anything like this. And this is what you hear from everybody who's confronted this coronavirus. And COVID-19 
is called a novel coronavirus for a reason. It's the first time we've ever seen it. It's the beginning of this pandemic. And so there was so much that we simply did not know about it at the beginning. It's been a true learning curve and a learning process that, you know, it's frightening for what it can do. A lot of unknowns and a lot of confusion. For example, we learned pretty quickly that you would need testing, that you would need personal protective equipment. And because we got caught so quickly with it, it couldn't be found anywhere. That complicated our approach at the beginning, but we did know one thing about all this from medical professionals, that people that were kept in confined populations were at the greatest risk because this particular virus spreads and spreads rapidly through social contact, particularly through droplets in the air. So it's an instance where breathing alone can cause a real problem. Coughing, singing, laughing, those things can spread this virus. We had to begin thinking about the confined populations that we have in the Justice Cabinet, and we have four populations that we needed to manage. First of all, we had to manage those folks that are incarcerated, the ones in the prisons. We have about 23,000, 24,000 convicted persons in the Commonwealth. About 12,000 of them are housed in our prison institutions. We have 13 of those institutions that they're scattered amongst. We also have juvenile detention centers. There are eight of those, and at any one point in time, they can house from two to 300 children. And then the jails are very much a big part of our population because approximately 11,000 of our state inmates are housed in the jails by statutes. Those that are convicted of class D or have a class C felony conviction where they receive the minimum of five years. So our population is almost split in half between local county jails and our institutions. And then finally, we had a huge community that we had to be cognizant of. And those are those folks that are uh, by probation and parole out on community release. And there are over 50,000 of them in the Commonwealth. We immediately tried to figure out what to do. Well, nobody really knew at the beginning, but there were, there were some common sense things that we knew. And we, we determined that there were really two steps we had to take here. We had to prevent it from getting into these institutions if we could, prevention. And then if it did, we had to contain it. So we started with prevention really early. We suspended any family visits to anyone in the institutions in early March. We soon followed that by stopping all outside contacts, for example, teachers, program persons that came into the jail. Why? Because we knew it was not in the institutions at the beginning, and the way that it was going to get there was if somebody brought it in. We realized that we were going to have to enhance sanitation. We used bleach water, germicide, and we had multiple daily cleanings of all surfaces. We, we added additional hand sanitizer and soap. We did temperature screenings of the inmates inside the institution. We were very concerned about social distancing. We set up something I'd never heard of before, foot sanitation trays, so that when everybody walks into the building or into a dorm, they walk through this tray and they sanitize their feet. Early, early on, it occurred to me that masks could be helpful, and now this is what you hear. Masks may not be full personal protection. We wear them mostly to protect others, but now the data is showing it also protects the person who wears it. We restricted group activities within the institution, and we consulted with public health about, okay, what do we do? But in spite of all those steps, the virus did get in one of our institutions. And so we were no longer just doing prevention, we had to move to containment. I think everyone's heard the governor, it's been on the news about the Green River Correctional Complex, the first one of our institutions that has shown an outbreak we had to move to containment very quickly because things were happening fast. And very early on in this process, there were three deaths at Green River Correctional Complex. 
This was before we could get even adequate, let alone mass testing, and before we could get all we needed of PPE. We were at quite a loss. We just continued with all of our sanitation methods. But about the time the outbreak got large at Green River, we started to get tests. We started to get PPE. And so as part of our containment, we, we set up this process where we test massively. We do contact tracing. And it helped us to group the inmates into four groups, those that were negative, those that were negative but that had been exposed, those that are positive, and those that were medically vulnerable. And you know what? This appears to work. This testing and separation works. We are now at the place in Green River out of 366 total positive cases. We have only one active inmate case and two active staff cases, which is amazing. And it's a process that we know that's work, that works. And that's a good thing because we have currently an outbreak at the Kentucky Correctional Institute for Women at Pee Wee Valley. But we're better prepared now. We have more tests, we have more equipment, and we have what we're calling the Green River Protocol, which allows us to do this testing and separation, which we know that works. There are 63 positive inmates at um, KCIW out of 639. There are 244 staff there and only seven positive. With this protocol we have in place, we feel like we have found a method that can adequately address contained populations out of our 13 prisons. We've had two outbreaks, one that's had one inmate test positive but recover and it did not spread, and three staff that are recovered now. So 11 of our 13 institutions have had no outbreak by the grace of God. And we're very grateful for that every day. For our other populations to report on them, we have had no positive state inmates in the county jails. They have done an amazing job. We are very connected to the Kentucky Jailers Association. They have half of our inmates. We partner with them. We do have one outbreak in Grayson County. It's being treated with a similar protocol to what I just described. In our juvenile institutions, we had one youth test positive. He's recovering and only two, steps, uh, two staff. And for the community-based pr probation and parole treatment, out of all of that, only one staff person tested positive. He has recovered. We don't know of any of our supervisees that are positive and they're taking all kinds of creative effort to deal with it. So our response is evolving and it's really successful in big part, I think, because of what the Chief Justice did. And I'm not gonna steal his thunder and talk about that, but I will say that almost 6,000 people were released from those jails on pretrial release, which has enabled them to spread the inmates out and do the social distancing that's proved to be correct and very, very helpful. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk about the pretrial population. That's certainly an area that we've been focusing on um, in terms of some policy work. And I appreciate that summary. I think in the beginning versus where we are now, there's just so much that we've been able to learn about how to stop the virus in its tracks. And so that's helpful that you're able to apply that to other facilities. I think I'll go to Chief Justice Minton and have you talk a little bit about um, some of the things you've had to do in the court system. You, you testified recently before an interim joint committee of the legislature and you made a really good point that we can choose to go to restaurants and retail, but you can't choose whether or not to appear in court. Uh, and so I, I'm wondering if did that create an extra obligation for you um, to protect people and did you have to put some um, pretty significant changes in place and, and oh. do you see any of those staying on permanently. Yeah, yes, Kate, thank you for, for that. I appreciate the, uh, the uh, boost that uh, Secretary Noble has given us too. Uh, she and I have been colleagues for a long time and uh, it's a pleasure to be on the, on the uh, program with her again. Uh, the, the bench behind me, her seat was just uh, over my shoulder there that she occupied for so many years and we miss her. Uh, you know, we had to respond pretty quickly, uh, as Mary pointed out, uh, with no, uh, no instruction manual, uh, nothing to tell us uh, how to do this. We just had to do the best we could. Uh, beginning in March, uh, I uh, worked with our judges to encourage our judges to work with the jailers in each of the counties 
uh, to responsibly begin responsibly releasing as many uh, inmates as possible and as quickly as possible to avoid uh, the potential for this devastating uh, outbreak. Uh, and uh, I'm really proud of how swiftly our justice partners, the, uh, the judges, the jailers, the prosecutors, the defenders all worked really closely together uh, to come up with a safe way to release pretrial these, these low risk defenders that are being uh, uh, detained in county jails. You know, we've been, we've been working for a long time on addressing the problems associated with the high costs of, of pretrial detention, the high costs in terms of, you know, counties uh, are, are, are acutely aware of how, how much it's costing the county budgets to, to maintain these local jails. And so this pandemic was just an added, added uh, impetus for us to take a, a stronger look at it. So the, the Supreme Court issue actually uh, expanded our emergency uh, release to uh, allow for the administrative release of low level offenders who were not uh, nonviolent, who were uh, not charged with sex crimes uh, and provide a way for them to be released administratively. Now, the judges still would review uh, bail uh, as they normally do, but this group would be released quicker. Uh, we would release them rather than bringing them into the jail population. And that was one of the ways that we addressed the, uh, the problems of this confined population uh, early on, on the pretrial end, whereas Justice Noble has uh, addressed what happens uh, in the corrections side. Uh, I was addressing what we do on the front end. Uh, and the courts and the jailers have uh, worked closely together. The, the Jailers Association, as uh, Miriam mentioned, uh, was really active in, in helping us. We made, we needed, we had a lot of the, the, the basis for technology already in place. Fortunately, we had, had done that. Uh, but we were just sitting on it in many places. We, we had it available, but we had never had to use it. So now we had to find ways to use it. And because the County Jailers Association was willing to go in and, and put in the technology on the jail side, then we could handle these hearings uh, remotely without having to transport the prisoner out of the jail and into the courthouse and then bring that prisoner back into the to the jail setting. So we were able to, with the help of the, jail, the jailer Association uh, and the county judges to get that moving really quickly. Uh, and it was very successful. And I'm really, really pleased with the, the level of cooperation that we've seen with that. And did you see any pushback from um, some of your judges or, or victims groups or any regarding this, this pretrial release? Well, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't expect to do anything without getting pushed back from some, in some direction. Uh, but really we had very little because people were scared. People are afraid. And we didn't know what the pandemic meant, but we did know, as Justice Noble very, you know, you know observed, we do know that people in confined spaces are at great risk. Uh, and if it uh, were to break out in the jail, uh, it would spread quickly. Uh, and so... Uh, I think we found a, a great deal of cooperation because people were afraid. Um, and as I, uh, as I mentioned, as you mentioned earlier, you know, with, with the court system, I felt a, an added level of responsibility uh, because uh, uh, you and I can make a decision uh, on our own about whether we decide to go out to eat or we decide to go to a party or whatever we were going to do where we would make our own choices. These folks don't have those choices because uh, of maybe other choices they've made, but they uh, have made choices that now put them in a situation where they don't have control over their environment. So, uh, you know, people who were compelled to come to court uh, needed, we need to think twice about compelling anybody to come into a public building and expose themselves to, uh, uh, to each other. Uh, whether they're coming as parties in a piece of litigation, whether they're coming as jurors, whether they're coming to renew their driver's license, for whatever reason you, you would come into the courthouse, we needed to make sure you didn't have to come if you didn't have to come, and if you came, that it was a safe place to be there. So we, we really tried to do as much as we can to protect people 
the justice system has to work, but the justice system can't kill people. Thank you. And Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit about some of the programs that you all offer um, for those who aren't as familiar with Volunteers of America? Um, and especially how it, how the pandemic has impacted those who were justice involved that you serve. Sure. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, at Volunteers of America, we provide services and supports to about 600 people at a time who are living in residential programs uh, that we own and operate. And so similar to how I heard Secretary Noble describe all of the protocols that they've implemented, on a smaller scale, so have we at VOA. I was so fortunate to be in Washington, D.C., visiting with Leader McConnell and Congressman Yarmouth the very first week of March. And I came back to Kentucky appreciating the severity and the, the scale and magnitude as much as I could at that time, that this was very serious and it really sprung me into action. So we adopted all of the CDC guidelines very proactively, as proactively as we could. And I'm so grateful that we did because we have, of the 600 clients that we're serving, um, here now almost to the end of June, I can share with you that we've had one person test positive and that person wasn't a residential client, it was a non-residential client. Um, we've had two employees in a residential setting test positive and we were able to, to isolate and contain that. So I applaud our staff who have done an extraordinary job of maintaining this level of hypervigilance. But one of the unique uh, conundrums that we find ourselves in is that we've had to, in some cases, limit the population so that we could adequately spread people out and do have space to quarantine people while they're newly admitted, while we observe them and make sure that they're ready to move into the population or into the milieu. We've also had to reduce the number of people that we're putting in bedrooms and reduce the size of people in a group setting at one time. At the same time that we know this pandemic is creating, I think I can say this safely, a layer of stress for all of us, and people suffering from substance use disorder don't have the healthiest coping skills with stress. So just three data points that I think are so significant. Um, fatal overdoses were up 42% in Fayette County through the end of May this year versus last year, up 42%. In Madison County, they report EMS runs where naloxone was administered more than doubled between April 15th and May 15th. And then the Office for Drug Control Policy nationally estimated 16% increase in overdoses through May of this year when we look back a year ago. So at the same time that people are more prone to using and potentially overdosing and needing access to treatment, we're either having to artificially limit the number of people in our programs or people are skittish and anxious about coming into treatment and being in a communal environment. And I'll just add one more quick thing. We opened a brand new program the second week of March in Manchester, Kentucky. I never imagined we'd be opening a brand new program in a new part of Kentucky for us in a remote part of Southeastern Kentucky for women pregnant and parenting and substance use disorder. So trying to roll out the red carpet and welcome safely women who are pregnant to residential treatment has been an interesting challenge. And again, my complete credit to our local staff there who have outreached and supported people making that very brave decision. It's brave on a good day, much less during a pandemic. Um, we I think Jennifer has frozen on us. We talked that this might happen with her service. Hopefully she'll she'll rejoin. I'll, I'll go ahead and take it to you, Aubrey, if you wanna talk for just a minute and then I wanna come back to this issue of um, treatment facilities and capacity. But Aubrey, any uh, general thoughts on um, policy trends that you're seeing in the states as states are dealing with um, the issue of the, of the pandemic and dealing with our corrections court system and recovery systems? Any general thoughts on that? Yes, thanks for having us today, Kate. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking with all of you. Um, so Red of Crime works in a couple different states throughout the country. Um, and 
overall, we've been pretty big on the idea that we weren't going to push policies purely because of a pandemic. Um, so everything we've been pushing has been uh, reforms and policies that we um, would advocate for outside of the realm of a pandemic, primarily with the goal of reducing over incarceration and improving public safety while saving taxpayer money. Um, so of course, over the last few months, we saw this in Kentucky sessions, uh, legislative sessions in other states either were cut short or maybe um, advocate groups like us weren't able to be in the Capitol as much. Um, but two big successes we saw one was from the state director in Louisiana. He had been working on a bill with a legislator there who's a small business owner. And he's actually not usually a criminal justice reform type, um, but he had been working on a bill drafted in December to have probation and parole officers there use alternatives to in-person meetings, um, primarily relying on video conferencing. So um, the goal was to help businesses with their probationers and parolees on, on their staffs. Um, businesses were struggling with employees having to be out all day waiting for their meetings with their officers. Uh, plus there's always just the risk involved, public safety risk of in-person meetings outside of um, the pandemic. So the timing couldn't have been any more fortuitous than it was. And it kept officers, probationers, parolees from having to interact face to face. But it was also a big win for the business community in Louisiana because um, businesses employing second chance employees uh, won't have to have their employees away from their desks all day. They just have to have their video check-in meetings. And then another thing in Tennessee, this wasn't as a result of anything their legislature did, but similar to Kentucky, um, they focused a lot, their courts focused a lot on reducing their pretrial populations. Um, so, so Tennessee's system I understand is a lot more decentralized than Kentucky's is. So each circuit court developed a plan for pretrial hearings, many of which involved relying on a risk assessment tool. Um, they were obviously much less inclined to use bail for their pretrial hearings, and it forced Tennessee into having a conversation on bail reform where it probably wouldn't have otherwise happened. Um, so those are two big, big things we saw in other states and um, We've been happy with what Kentucky's been doing too. Thank you, Aubrey, and welcome back, Jennifer. We lost you <laughs> towards the end, and it's inevitable. I was on a roll. <laughs> we talked about the chance that that might happen with our uh, connections today. But if you want to pick up, I think what you were telling us about is some of the access to treatment issues that we were having with concerns about coming into facilities and being exposed to the pandemic and the fact that. We're dealing with individuals that may have some challenges coping when yeah. things aren't in pandemic mode. Yeah, well, and the final point I wanted to make is that we opened a program uh, the second week of March in Manchester, Kentucky, and our program is focused on treating women who are pregnant and parenting and substance use disorder, where they bring their kids into treatment with them. So imagine trying to open with brand new staff in a, in a community that's this, this treatment model is brand new to them in the midst of a pandemic. And yet our local staff have done an amazing job of outreaching and nurturing people and making that decision that it's actually safer to be in treatment than to continue to use. We have nine women living with us today in Manchester. We have three healthy babies that we've delivered just in the past 60 days. So I'm very hopeful that this program will continue to have positive impact and we're trying not to let COVID-19 slow us down. That's great. And I want to stay on that topic of uh, substance use disorder treatment. Secretary Noble, I know you have programming that you all offer um, for those um, who are, are in the reentry population. Any thoughts on those services? Have they been curtailed at all? Or are you having any challenges filling positions related to that? Um, currently, and is that still working the way you expect it to? We, we've actually got two issues on this. One is just ordinary supervision, and the other is, and you might want to talk about that later, is how do you deal with the re-entry situation as far as employment is concerned? You know, I mentioned a minute ago that on community supervision, we've got over 50,000 people between parole and probation. 
that are out in the community. We have 750 staff members and over 500 of them are actually officers that go one-on-one -on -one with the people that they're supervising. That's a large community. And when COVID hit, we were trying to determine, is this an essential function? Well, it's pretty darned essential. But at the same time, how do you protect the clients? How do you protect our, our employees? So we really tried to get creative. We started first with doing some telephonic reporting where folks would call in, they'd have the conversation with the worker, and it was surprisingly effective. But as you might imagine, workers that are used to working with people one-on-one -on -one wanted to, to lay eyes on them. They wanted to see them. So we moved to um, more creative measures, such as virtual reporting. And I was very concerned about that at first because I thought, you know, what if somebody doesn't have a computer? Well, I learned that while folks might not have a computer, darn near everybody's got a cell phone. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a cell phone, you can make it work. And so that's been very effective. And they've come up with other creative measures, such as curbside drive-through reporting, where our workers gear up and they go out and the folks drive by and they have their check-ins and their conversations and take temperatures if they need to or do other types of testing and checking on their clients. And we have something new that's going to be absolutely kind of new age and great, I think, that we're calling the Client Portal app that we think we'll have up and running by the fall. We have our field officers using it now and through their cell phones, they are able to access um, our offender management system. So they have the information right at their fingertips that they might need to deal with someone they're supervising. So in the fall, we're gonna get it, try to get it moved over to the actual people in the community and they can report in, for example, from a work break or during childcare or while they're on approved travel, it's really increasing access. And you know, one of the things, and I think this goes to your question about how does this affect our future? You know, they've had to drag me screaming and kicking into the computer age, frankly. I'm an old dinosaur and I've learned more and more as we've gone along how useful it can be. But I had no idea that you could really reasonably communicate with Skype, with uh, Teams, with Zoom in a way that is effective and efficient and is still protective of people. And so now we're, th we're thinking about how can we translate that to our community to make life a little bit more efficient, perhaps easier for those that we're supervising. And I think that this developing this app is one of those things. It lets everybody be more mobile and you get critical information very, very quickly. And so, those are some of the things that we're looking at from the supervisory standpoint, because there were so many of them. We had to look at ways that we're not going to spread the coronavirus, but that we're yet going to keep the context that we needed to have in place. That's great. Chief Justice, do you uh, agree with some of those virtual opportunities or in especially in rural parts of the state? Do you think some of those changes might be permanent? Yeah, I do. Um, um, I, I was listening to what uh, Secretary Noble was saying about the groups. You know, we, we have the drug court program, uh, the court program, the mental health courts, some DUI court. We have various specialty courts then around the Commonwealth. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, this, the process involves, you know, group meetings and, 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 and drug testing, regular drug testing. So one of the great challenges that COVID has presented for us would be the, the fact that the drug testing has to be observed and how do you do that with social distancing? You really can't. So we had to come up with new ways to achieve that. And uh, we did that uh, with, uh, I know here in the Warren County Justice Center and other justice centers around the state, we've set up a remote, you know, outdoor in the parking lot, drive in uh, uh, that's done by a mouth swab. Um, so we've done that. Uh, the, the group of meetings, which are so important in recovery, uh, the group sharing, the group support, um, has been a challenge uh, because people, are, you know, people will tend. All of us tend to feel isolated in this uh, in this environment. And so we've had to had to deal with those feelings of isolation. But these, the, the capability that technology has given us, as, as Barry says, 
Um, we, we have uh, group meetings down by Zoom or Skype. Everybody has access to a cell phone that they can use, um, and they do. And we've been holding groups. As others have mentioned in this panel, um, they can uh, now instead of having to leave work and go to group, they can just step away from their job uh, wherever they are and attend their group session and go, you know, go back to their normal activity. So there've been some things that have, have been developed out of necessity through the use of technology that I think will be long-term benefits for the system uh, in many ways, in many ways. Uh, we've learned a lot about how to do things differently. That has, uh, I, I often quote my, my friend, the colleague, my colleague, the Chief Justice in Michigan, who said, you know, th this was not the crisis we wanted, but it may be the crisis we needed to push us into using technology and other alternatives in ways that we would never have even done had we not been forced to do so. And we're seeing the benefits of it. And, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. There aren't many good things that can be said about this. But for us, I think uh, I can say that's going to be a benefit long term. I agree. And I think, you know, in our perspective at the chamber, how do we merge in-person opportunities with technology? Since there are some who, for whatever reason, may miss out on an in-person interaction that might benefit from joining through um, a platform like this. And so I think going forward, we're going to try to find ways to, to combine the two, because certainly in-person communication and interaction is, is pretty important for the work that we do. Um, but there are times when technology works as well. So I think those are good points. Um, Chief Justice Mitten, I'll stick with you. I want to talk a little bit about pretrial, a little bit more. I hate to hammer it over and over, but there's been some statistics about this group of individuals. I, I want to say it's around 6,000 or so that's been um, emergency release pretrial. And we have some numbers on numbers of uh, folks that have been arrested since being released. And it's well, really, you yeah, would have I, I would have, yeah, I would have said in, in response to your question earlier uh, in our discussion about the pushback and, you know, the, the, the immediate uh, reaction to the idea that we're going to be releasing folks administratively as soon as they're arrested. Then there are those who would say they don't like this catch and release uh, program that the courts are uh, instituting uh, because it's just putting the, you know, that we, we just caught this person and now you're releasing them back into the community. You know, surprisingly, we have seen, our numbers have demonstrated, and Aubrey, this is going to make you smile, that the uh, 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 statistics show that over the length of time we've been doing this, the, the, uh, the re-arrest rate is actually lower than it was uh, this time last year when we weren't in the middle of this administrative release. So we're, we're seeing surprisingly, uh, maybe, maybe not a surprise to some of you, but for those of us who've been in this business a long time, that was a concern, you know, this, this idea of this criticism of catch and release. Well, we were holding low level people uh, in custody that didn't need to be held, quite frankly. And I think that these numbers have demonstrated that public safety has not been compromised. Uh, and yet we have been able to, to save money and more importantly, I think save lives. Uh, and I think that's a learning that's gonna be valuable for us going forward. Because your next question is gonna be, if it's not yours, somebody out there is going to send in the question, okay, well, when are you gonna stop doing this? Uh, so, you know, we're going to have to, we're going to have to continue to look. as long as this is working. Uh, I think we need to continue to stick with it and see how it works. Uh, because so far what we're seeing is not a bad thing. And I think this, this is a little in the weeds, but I'll go there. The other point in your order was the pretrial risk assessment. I think you ordered to be done within 24 hours. And I think that was important to you to speed it up um, since there is that assessment that's done uh, regarding uh, bail. Um, and this is an area that the chambers worked on and, and specifically in Aubrey too, on, on dealing with the cash piece of bail. Um, so hopefully that's something that we can continue to talk about in these statistics. Yeah. I think it'll be helpful yeah. in helping people who are concerned about that. I agree, I agree. Yeah. Um, so good conversation, this is great, thank you. Um, Aubrey, do you wanna add anything to that on bail reform before we move on? Yeah, I'll quickly add a little bit. Um, the Chief Justice, I would echo a lot of what he just said, and I appreciate what he said. Um, this 
the pandemic's kind of just forced us into a bail reform experiment uh, when we weren't planning on it. Um, and so you have these local court officials releasing thousands of individuals to await trial at home rather than in jail where they'd risk infection. So we've been um, both able to protect public safety and keep hopefully um, the coronavirus from spreading more in jails. Um, so, and, and these individuals, as we focused on in our work with you all at the chamber and other advocate groups, they're typically nonviolent, non-sexual offenders who we believe could safely await trial at home rather than remain in jails pre-trial, uh, mainly because they just can't afford to pay their bail. Um, I was gonna touch on the re-arrest rate, but Chief Justice already brought that up. Um, so that's a huge data point in favor of our continued efforts to push bail reform in the General Assembly, um, because it's, it's a good reflection that without jeopardizing public safety, Kentucky and its counties can save money by um, upholding the presumption of pretrial release, or at least the nonviolent, non-sexual offenders who are unlikely to reoffend. Um, it's important, obviously, that we're relying on our risk assessment tool to um, help in those judgments. Um, but between the chamber, right on crime, this other group, uh, we have been working on bail reform in recent legislative sessions, um, and kind of the overarching goals that we have continued to push would be the focus on public safety. Someone shouldn't be detained pretrial solely because they can't afford to pay their bail, just as we don't want dangerous criminals to be um, back out on the streets just because they have the means to pay their bail. Um, reasonably reducing the pretrial population. So we've seen obviously that a lot over the last few months. Uh, maintaining judicial discretion and then continuing to look for solutions to various other peripheral issues on this topic like substance abuse treatment and reducing overcriminalization. Thank you. I want to switch mm -hmm. gears for a minute and talk about uh, juvenile justice issues and young adult population. I know this is something, Jennifer, that you all work on quite a bit as well. Secretary Noble, you have quite a bit of experience on this issue. Um, Jennifer, can you talk a little bit about your pro uh, programs for justice-involved youth and young adults and any trends that you're seeing in those populations given the pandemic? Yeah, you know, our restorative justice program has had just phenomenal engagement from our youth. Um, using telehealth, we have been able to engage virtually not only the youth, but their circles of support and family members. So we've had really high engagement. And while our referrals are a bit down, given courts have been closed, even since they've reopened, um, we have started a steady flow of uh, referrals again. This restorative justice program has been in Jefferson County for about 10 years. And with the partnership of Chief, Chief Justice Minton, um, Lori Dudgeon and Rachel Bingham at AOC, and of course, Secretary Noble, we're getting ready to take this program to Southeastern Kentucky. And so another example of opening and launching a new program in the midst of a pandemic, we'll be serving seven counties over three judicial districts beginning next month. And I'm really thrilled that we've been able to staff up uh, we actually have our chief operating officer on the ground there today um, looking at space where we'll locate um, our offices. And so we haven't, again, wanted COVID-19 to slow us down from making these services accessible to those who need us most. And we've been really impressed with the level of engagement that we've had virtually with the youth that we're serving. Great. Secretary Noble, do you have anything to add? I know that's an area expertise for you in dealing with juvenile justice issues? I'm very excited with the program that's going toward restorative justice and we um, we're sponsoring it through our cabinet and we're, we're just tickled that that's getting started because one of the things that's so amazing about it is that it's instructional for kids but it also catches them early and it makes them look at the victim's side, see the perspective, from the person that they've done whatever they've done to. And then they negotiate or bargain out on what's an appropriate response. So it's, it's, there's not a lot of really solid research on it, but common sense tells you it works and it's a good plan. It's probably the way we were all raised. Also for um, the juvenile population, I will say that 
according to our statistics, everything has been fairly consistent through this. We also released a number of children from uh, juvenile supervision. And in doing that, we thought, okay, what's gonna happen? Are we gonna have kids that are gonna crash and burn? Are we gonna have problems? And really we find, because we uh, track this through detention intakes, that these are fairly consistent throughout the pandemic so far, and they've actually declined in some areas. And there tends to be a little more involvement in the urban areas, as I know Jennifer can attest. But, you know, one of the things about the urban areas, and this is an area where we're worried and we're working toward getting programs in to do something about it, is that um, my cabinet is also partnering with U.S. Attorney Russell Coleman from the Western District about programs and teachings and things that we can do to try to decrease violent youth crime because that's the worst thing that we're seeing now, but it's not because of the pandemic. It's because of gang activity and they're involving people at younger and younger ages. And so it's not really COVID related, although that no doubtedly adds a level of stress, but it's a problem that um, the community in Louisville has gotten very involved with. They're uh, planning on bringing in some programmatic people and working with kids in the community that are identified as gang related to try to help to educate them out of feeling that the only belonging they have is through a gang. And then of course, you know, um, back when Senate Bill 200, and Chief knows all about it, was on the boards. I was privileged to get to work with that a lot. And I think we have made a lot of reforms. We need to continue them, carry them out. We see some real, we, we have a wonderful commissioner, Commissioner Lashana Harris, who's very enthusiastic, wants to work very hard toward those things. So I see some good things coming up for juvenile justice in this state. Great, thank you. And I'll switch gears again and talk a little bit about re-entry. Um, and I do wanna stick with you, Secretary Noble, for this one. Uh, this is an area that's really important for the Kentucky Chamber because we are very much engaged on re-entry issues. Uh, we're part of a coalition that formed kind of informally when the pandemic hit to help with all of those individuals that were on emergency release um, because of the pandemic. We put together a really great resource that you can find on the Kentucky Smart on Crime website for those who are returning citizens. And then we also have a really great Who's Hiring campaign where we have surveyed all of those employers to determine who are second chance employers. And we've listed those um, um, through the campaign, which you can find on our Restart Kentucky page. So that's just a little plug. So make sure people are aware <laughs> of those resources. Couldn't help myself. Um, but Secretary, can you talk a little bit about your all's re-entry programs and specifically how employers um, who are second chance employers can engage with your staff on this? We are really excited about this opportunity. I, I think the chamber knows that. I told you all that. That's my big thing for working with the chamber when we got started. We have 11 employees whose sole job is to connect our population with employment or programming training that gives them a second chance. And in that process over the last two years, they've been out doing what you've been doing, beating the bushes, and we've created a catalog of what we call second chance employers. And we were so grateful to them because they are willing to take a chance on people that get paroled or people that are out on probation to give them employment and employment training. Um, our 11 workers spend time in the community making these employer contacts. So anytime any employer out there that would like to be involved as a second chance employer, call me, I'll put you in touch with whoever needs you. But it is true that right now things are kind of in a holding pattern, as you might imagine, because COVID restricted travel. It restricted our people going out and making contacts. And so some of our services have been curtailed for now because for one th uh, reason, state offices have been uh, closed while people were um, working from home. One of the biggest things has to do with personal identification. When you release someone, even though we've got really willing second chance employers, people have to have legal ID. And that's been a hurdle that's been hard to come by. And it's really hard to come by now with the closure of offices and the changeover that we have from our old fashioned driver's license to the real ID driver's license. 
And I'm pleased to say that we are in a partnership now or striving to be in one with the transportation cabinet where we plan to try to set up a situation that a short time before release of people from our institutions, they can, uh, they will come to the prison, they will make a, an ID, a legal ID, so that when the release date serves, comes up, they're served out, all they have to do is walk out with adequate identification and hopefully be ready to go to work and resume their life. So we're excited about that and hope that we can get that program worked out soon. That's great news. You know, that's something that we have worked on at the chamber. It's apparently been under, um, been worked on in, in Kentucky for years. Other states struggle with this. You would think it'd be something simple, but it's pretty complex. Um, and I think it's an important part of, of returning as a citizen and getting employment is having an appropriate ID. So I'm so glad that you and Secretary Gray are working on that. Thank you for doing that. Um, we're getting close to the end of our, our session. And I, you know, I, I think it's really important that we talk about some of the racial issues that are happening in Kentucky and nationally and the racial disparity that we see in our corrections and justice system. And I kind of wanted to get your all's feedback on that before we end our call today. Jennifer, I'll start with you. You're in Louisville. Your offices are in downtown Louisville. Of course, we've seen protests in that area for now. I think we're on four weeks, coming up on four weeks of that. Um, so there's there's obviously been a lot of um, activity. Do you want to weigh in on this and how you all are engaged? I do. So we are at 4th and Chestnut. Our headquarters is two blocks from the epicenter of the protest and we, like most businesses here in this corridor of downtown, were um, damaged and vandalized uh, several weeks ago. So we are still boarded up, um, like most of the downtown business district. And I have to tell you, this has awakened in me a desire to work even harder in the community. Volunteers of America is in a unique position, not only because of our mission and those we serve. 51% of our workforce is minority. And who we serve, 25,000 people a year, tend to be mostly black and brown community members. So it's on point from a mission standpoint, but also the kinds of relationships that we have organizationally that span um, from progressive to conservative and everywhere in between. There's a part of our mission that most everyone can appreciate in terms of its return on investment, in terms of impact. And so we've been working hard to, to bring some different sectors of our community together and really act as a convener to see how we can participate in a meaningful way. I think what's happened locally with the passing of the no-knock ban, um, I think there's going to be an increased appetite amongst our General Assembly to consider some comprehensive reforms in 2021. I know that um, Senator Paul has indicated that he wants to work on this at, at the federal level. We've um, been talking about how restorative justice can be applied at a more macro level, not just person to person, but group to group, communities of color with law enforcement. So I'm eager to take that as a solution into the community to say, how can we um, support people who are being harmed and foster a constructive dialogue? So I think there's some real policy opportunities here, and I think there's some real healing opportunities here, and, and we want to be a part of that. Thank you. And Secretary Nobles is something that you track within the correction system um, and something that you all are, are addressing as well. We do track it with the numbers of inmates that we have. According to the U.S., the latest U.S. Census data for Kentucky, the state population of Black African or, or African American persons is 8.4 percent. Yet, when we look at incarcerations, there are 27 people on death row. 11% of them are African American. In our inmate population of over 20,000 persons, almost 22% of them are African American. And even for those that are on supervision in our communities, which is better than being incarcerated, you're still on supervision, we have roughly 14% of them are African American. When you look at those numbers, someone might say, those are fairly small numbers compared to your total numbers. The problem with that analysis is they're not at all proportional. They're not proportional to the number of African Americans in this state. And that is a real sensitive point. We've got to look at it. 
Is it because there is different policing? Is it because the justice system is not truly blind? Is it because we put higher sentences on African Americans? There are many valid questions and the, the chief will remember this. When I was on the Supreme Court, we had a large panel that did a study on the death penalty and a big section of it talked about proportionality and how we had to look at how much more proportionally the criminal justice system impacted the African-American community. We are in the process now of looking at policy. Certainly everybody is conscious that we need to be addressing these issues. And we are partnering, partnering with Dr. Aaron Thompson from the education cabinet. He's the head of post-secondary education. And we're going to begin to do what we call cultural competency training. And his perspective on it is that language is certainly a big part of what we think and do. Perspective with how we look at someone. He is really a good trainer on this. He's done it for corporations and police departments all over this country. And he's going to help us by doing a seminar for where you train the trainers. We're gonna be bringing in our staff, uh, our commissioners, our deputy commissioners, the admin staff, we're gonna get trained on it probably within the next six weeks or so. And then we're gonna permeate that throughout all of our institutions. Because while we've had some training on this issue, more is good. And I think we really do need to remind everybody to keep thinking about any inequity that you see, certainly this one. Thank you. And Dr. Thompson's a great friend of the chamber, a great partner of ours. So that's great to hear that you're working with him and yeah. please keep us up to date on that for sure. And I will point out that we did do a webinar last week on racial inequities in Kentucky that's posted on our website as a more broader discussion of this issue um, and including um, how it fits into the criminal justice and the justice system in general. So more, more to come on that too. So um, we are about at the end of our session. Any final remarks that I, any of you want to make? Um, really appreciate all of the great discussion today. Justice Minton, any final remarks you'd want to share? Well, I, I did want to take a chance, an opportunity here to just to follow up on the comments that, that were made uh, just before this with uh, regarding the racial uh, disparity. Uh, we, we've, been, we've been aware of this, uh, painfully aware of this. Uh, the fact that racism and prejudice is just so... Uh, firmly fixed in our system and resistant to change. Uh, we've been trying to address this. Of course, the, the current events really have focused attention more closely on this, but over the past few years, beginning with our study of the juvenile justice population and how many African-American males we're sending into the juvenile justice uh, system as opposed to the, you know, the, the Caucasian males. Those disparities have been very troubling to us, and we, we have been really conscious in, in this uh, training that Justice Noble had mentioned. Uh, all of the judges, the clerks uh, in our system and the staff at AOC uh, have been undergoing this, this type of training, uh, trying to root out, trying to recognize so we can root out the implicit bias that exists in the system. So th this is a serious matter, and we take it very seriously, and, and we certainly recognize our own failures uh, and that we have to address it. Thank you. Well said. I think I'll end on that note. I think that that's an appropriate way to end the session. And I do want to thank you, Secretary, Chief Justice, Jennifer, Aubrey. I'll be seeing you all in the, at the Capitol, certainly over the summer and, and come January. We'll be work, continuing to work on these issues, these policy issues. Again, please visit our website, kychamber.com, and click the Restart Kentucky banner at the top of the page to find all of the recordings of our webinars, as well as some of the resources that I shared with you this afternoon. And thank you again to our panelists and to everyone for joining us today. Take care.